circle and I can reenact it. And for 36 years, I used historical reenactment to pump life into the uh, subject of history for my students in my classroom, the ozone. And I'm not in the classroom anymore. So that means I've got to find a way to repurpose myself and find a way to use all that garb that I have at home, which fills a room. And my passion for bringing the past to life, I've got to channel it. So what I've been doing is I've been following California history, you know, especially of like the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And something I didn't get to do when I was uh, in the classroom because I was limited by my curriculum of what I could cover. So to that end, I have visited each mission in California and Asistencia and Presidio and I sought to tell the stories in garb and try to present a uh, a balanced approach to what was happening or what did happen and while I was doing that I stumbled across a reference to banditos and outlaws that hung out in saloons that were in missions the missions were secularized but still that kind of blew my mind that there were saloons and shops inside of mission buildings and so I started chasing banditos. Well, I'm continuing that chase now, which is why I'm driving through the desert at uh, oh, in mid-November at like six something in the morning and the sun is just rising and it's like 32 degrees. I'm on the trail of someone that I had a hangout out here. So I hope you stick with me on my journey as we look at another bandito, Lodovio Chavez. Okay, behind me over here, that's Robber's Roost. Okay, one of many places called Robber's Roost. This is the one that's a little bit uh, from Ridgecrest and Inyo Kern. And this is where Tiburcio Vazquez and Clodovio Chavez and the remnants of the gang ended up in 1874. Chavez was healing up from his leg wound that uh, Morse had reported. What ended up happening is by uh, early February, they ended up hitting a uh, a station, a stage station over at Coyote Holes. They tended to target lone travelers. They tended to target teamsters. They were really big on going after stages because even though there was silver coming south. That's harder to carry. They really wanted cash and jewelry. So going after stages was, you know, better for them. However, there was enough of a tirade of enough robberies taking place that something would have to be done and there were complaints. There was a writer to the Los Angeles Star who wrote, let us turn out dragoons with 30 days worth of rations and powder and ball and scour the countryside from Oregon to Cape Horn if necessary until Chavez and his gang are chained up in a dungeon. The response was to send a detachment of soldiers from Camp Independence or Fort Independence about 90 miles to the north. And the soldiers showed up and they ended up chasing out Vasquez, uh, Chavez, and the rest of the gang. When the army shows up, Vasquez and the gang split. 
they not, not split like going away, they split like going in different directions. Chavez decided to go visit Old Mexico again. Vasquez decided to head towards the rocks that are named after him, you know, Vasquez Rocks, and then ultimately going to Los Angeles. Well, while he's, Los Ange he's in Los Angeles, he ends up getting caught. He's betrayed, he's captured, and he's put on trial. He's taken up to San Jose for this. And what he's accused of and what he is found guilty of are the deaths that occurred during the Tres Pinos tragedy, which reportedly Vasquez did not order the killings. However, the law says you were involved. You know, if you were involved in a crime and people died, that's on you. Well, Chavez ends up writing a letter, which I don't know how much his word was worth, but he writes a letter to the court and saying, Vasquez didn't do the killing. Doesn't matter. Vasquez will end up getting executed early in 1875. In the same month that Vasquez gets executed, in, in March of 1875, Chavez is running around in the Mojave Desert. He uh, hits stage stops at Little Lake and at Granite Springs, and eventually ends up with a $2,000 reward on his head. So Chavez and his gang are rampaging around the Mojave Desert. And at one point, when they had conducted a stage holdup in Indian Valley, they'd grabbed a Wells Fargo box. And it turned out the box had about $50,000 in it. Well, in response to this, here comes another detachment of soldiers from Fort Independence, and they're pursuing the gang. And since the pursuit is so hot, Chavez buries the box, intending to return to it later. He never got to do that. And what ended up happening is the box ended up getting discovered by some treasure seekers about 1961. With soldiers pursuing him, Chavez says, enough of this, I'm out of here. And he again heads towards old Mexico, but he ends up uh, rustling a bunch of horses and takes them down there and loses the horses. Now we run into a little bit of weirdness. Um, Luis Raggio, the childhood friend of Chavez. They grew up together in San Juan Batista. The same Rajo who considered Chavez to be a bit of a bully. He is running some cattle over to a man named Baker in Arizona. And he discovers, lo and behold, Chavez is working there under an assumed name. Oh, by the way, there's another connection to Baker. Raggio's younger brother, his little brother, Vincent, is also working on that same ranch. And what ends up happening is Raggio finds out that Vincent stole some cattle from Baker at the behest of Chavez. And after Luis Raggio really gives a talking to, to Vincent Raggio, he goes looking for Chavez. And pretty much he gets the vibe that there's no way he's going to be able to get his brother away from the influence of this outlaw. And what ends up happening is he finally makes a decision. He's either, once he's figured out, hey, the rewards are still in place. I could still get $2,000 for this guy. He ends up bringing a couple of his uh, friends along with him and he tells them what to do and basically says hey you know gotta capture this guy well turns out the friends of Raggio decide they're gonna call for Chavez's surrender and Chavez starts shooting back so they kill him well now people don't really know who Chavez is 
in Arizona. And so there's this big to do about, hey, should we lynch these three guys? And what ends up happening is eventually, you know, Chavez gets identified and the doctor at Fort Yuma removes Chavez's head and places it in a jar. So you've got the same vibe going on as Joaquin Murrieta. Word traveled fast as far as the death of uh, Clodovio Chavez. I mean, it made national news. And in a lot of quarters, there was elation. Hey, he was considered a bad guy. However, his friends that knew him as a child were angry. They engaged in drunken brawls with Anglos and you know, the situation got ugly. But now go over to Arizona and you've got uh, Luis Raggio and his uh, two Confederates raising money so they can send Harry Roberts to San Juan Batista to get it identified. On May 9th, 1876, he showed up in San Juan Batista and he walked into this place behind me carrying a uh, rectangular oil can. Let's go inside. Let's assume that Harry Roberts walked in here. This is the saloon, very clearly. And he found the judge, or the local judge, and he brought the oil can in, set it on his desk, opened it up, and floating in alcohol was the head of Clodovio Chavez. But now we have a problem. We've got to identify it. By the way, his mother and his sister were in mourning and his mother said it was better that he died this way than to be dragged all over the state and hung like Vasquez was. Well, people were coming by and the, the state in the office like, for two days and people came by and Roberts made them sign affidavits to say, yep, that's him, that's Chavez, because he was gonna take this to Sacramento. He already has his two buddies breathing down his neck. It's like, you better get the money. So he's gonna to go to Sacramento once he gets a number of affidavits signed and turn the head in and get the cash. Well, that's the end of Clodovio Chavez's story. Now it's time to track down another bandito or outlaw. I hope you stick with me on my journey.